Dr. Antonio Rockus, I personally want to thank you. you number one, he's, number, he's one of the premier bad experts in the country. Uh, knows a lot about bipolar energy and therapy and has done a lot of research, really good research, interesting research. And I want to thank you personally. Uh, I was on Evgen ADT about four and a half years ago, and I didn't see a way out, and I wanted a way out, and I was willing to just gamble on anything. And I stumbled upon high testosterone and then your theories of BAT. And that saved my, I felt it saved my life. It extended my life at least as being a strong part or being a person who could do things and was, was active in my life. So thank you very much. Um, with that, uh, would you like to know a little about myself, my background? If not, I'll turn it over to you. And uh, if you can present maybe three to five slides, I'm sure we have lots of questions if that's okay with you. Yeah, if you want to give a background of yourself that's beyond what you just said, you, you can. Okay, I'm actually Gleason 9, and a lot of these guys here are Gleason 8, 9, 10. Uh, I had uh, surgery back in 2018, and at that time, uh, the Mayo Clinic gave me a 50-50 chance to get to two years, and that was doing Lupron full-time. I chose transdermal estrogen therapy doing that, and after four and a half months, I was looking in the mirror and and kind of breaking down personal personal uh, story there, personal admission. Um, I wanted to do something else. I uh, wanted to live uh, my life fully and uh, whatever man Russ, I think we've, we've lost you. Yeah, Russ, your internet we lost. So, um, Dr. Antonarakis, I think you should just go. Uh, and basically, it's good that Russ grounded us in a sort of a typical uh, patient. Uh, he has the profile of you know of a lot of people here. He's back. And, and, and my uh, my Zoom recording uh, dropped. My Zoom meeting dropped out for a minute, but I'm back. Uh, this is gonna okay. Be well, th thanks for that. I I caught some of it. Um, what I will do, because Brad didn't uh, exactly tell me how many slides, I have 23 slides, but I don't have to go through all of them. I just want to give you guys a flavor of, of you know, how this started and what we've learned so far, you know, some pearls. And clearly, this is not um, for everyone. And uh, beyond that, it can be dangerous if used indiscriminately. And, and Russ, you know, mentioned it himself. He said, I wanted to take a high risk approach. And, you know, it can be high risk for some people. So let me just share what, what I've learned about this over the past 10 years. If I can summarize that in 20 minutes or 30 minutes, so we can leave time for questions. And I, I might go through some of the more detailed scientific stuff a little bit faster. But of course, it's a paradox, right? Because we're giving high doses of testosterone, the thing that we have known for 60 years is the fuel for prostate cancer. So how is it possible that giving the cancer its fuel at super high doses, how can that kill the cancer? So that's why it's truly a paradox. Now, before I get any further, I, I want to give absolute credit to who I consider to be the godfather of bipolar androgen therapy. And as many of you have maybe seen the movie, I'm also a big fan of it. Um, the godfather of bipolar androgen therapy is Dr. Sam Denmead. And you know he was the discoverer of it. Uh, and he uh, designed many of the, uh, the first clinical trials that I was privileged to be part of because I was working alongside him when I was at Johns Hopkins. But I don't think any discussion of BAT can take place without showing a picture of Sam. He doesn't look quite this young anymore. This is a picture is about 10 years old. But the, the concept of bipolar androgen therapy, we don't want to confuse this with bipolar disorder. We're not making people become bipolar. We are actually using different poles, opposite extremes, that is, of testosterone levels. So as you can see, we're starting off with a castrate testosterone close to zero, and then we are giving men intramuscular injections of high-dose testosterone such that they achieve superphysiologic levels 
more than 1,000 and sometimes more than 1,500 nanograms per deciliter. And then over the course of 28 days, four weeks, the testosterone re returns to, to zero or close to zero. And then 28 days later, another injection and up it goes again and then down again. And the, the key about bipolar androgen therapy, which many people don't fully understand, is that we always continue the um, Eligard or Lupron or Zolodex. We, we continue all those drugs that suppress testosterone. And that's another paradox. And while we're continuing the testosterone suppressing drugs, at the same time, we're also giving the once every four weeks high dose testosterone injection. If we didn't do that, if we stopped the Eligard or the Lupron or those drugs completely, over time, what would happen is testosterone would continue to go up. And then over time, it would actually begin to fuel the cancer again. So we, we need to do both simultaneously. Keep the testosterone suppressed by using drugs like Lupron. And then at the same time, give a once every four weeks high dose injection of testosterone. I think that's a super uh, good point, and it's something that a lot of people don't quite understand. Uh, what you're doing is with a, with the LHRH, you're you're getting rid of the endogenous testosterone, correct? So then you can control it exogenously. Correct. I want to give you guys a bit of history. We treated our first patient in 2013, and then published our paper in 2015. So we've had a decade of experience. Um, th this. PSA graph here, it was from the very, very first patient that we treated. Dr. Denmead had a great sense of humor and he designed acronyms for all of his studies. The first study was called the LOVE study, L-O-V-E, and it was a, it was a play on words. And you know, the, the joke was that patients get their love life back and their sex life back, and, and many of them did actually. So we called it the LOVE study. Um, it's also the only type of therapy that I've ever seen when the Patients come with their spouses, the spouses, the wives have a big smile on their faces after many, many years of, of frowning. And it's because yes, the, the sex drive can come back. But the instructive thing about this very first patient was that you can see that his PSA initially went up before it went down. So there was a PSA of about 22 when he enrolled and it kind of went up to about 37 and then it kind of had this zigzag pat pattern. And then eventually by the third month, approximately dropped. And this patient um, had a response lasting 13 months. It's not the best response we've ever seen. We've seen much, much longer, of course. But the, the thing that was gratifying to us was that he had a very large pelvic mass here that you can see. And even after three cycles, it decreased in size and then by 12 cycles, it had disappeared. So the lesson number one is do not panic, do not freak out if your PSA goes up in the first one or even two cycles because it may go up prior to going down. And this table shows the eight bad studies that we've done over the decade between 2013 and 2023. And each one has an acronym. Um, and over the course of those 10 years, we have treated 402 patients on the study and also countless other patients that we treated outside of a study, either because they weren't eligible uh, or because they, they chose to not participate in the study, but still asked us to administer and oversee bat therapy, which we, we did after, um, you know, clearly outlining all the caveats and the risks with those patients. Now, I, I wanna go through a couple pearls. One is, when is the ideal time to give BAT? And you know the, the counter to that is, when should you not give BAT? And we have learned that we should not be giving BAT in patients that have hormone-sensitive prostate cancer. This is not something that you want to do in the initial phases of the disease as an alternative to androgen deprivation therapy. In those patients, it will make the cancer worse, will stimulate the cancer. So in, in other words, this is not a treatment for hormone sensitive prostate cancer. It's a treatment for castration resistant prostate cancer. And this graph shows it well. This is an artificial patient. 
his PSA is 100, he begins androgen deprivation therapy, the cancer goes into a dormant phase where the PSA becomes undetectable or close to undetectable. And then over the course of time, the cancer becomes so-called castration resistant and the PSA begins to go up despite testosterone being suppressed. And this is the phase of the disease, the, what I call the early castration resistant phase, ideally before the patient gets chemotherapy or other therapy where the bat is most beneficial in our experience. The second question is, what are the different types of responses or lack of responses that patients can have? And how common are these scenarios? And we, we have summarized it as three potential scenarios that we have seen in our clinic. Each of these three scenarios occurs roughly in about one third of patients that we treat with this approach. The best case scenario, which is shown in the red, are what we call the responders. And th this is the no-brainer. These are the patients who take the bipolar androgen therapy and their PSA goes down immediately and it remains suppressed and their disease shrinks on their scans. And um, this, this happens in about one third of patients. When we see this, there's really no dilemma or no question. You know, that the patients know that they're responding. We know that they're responding. Um, and it's, as I said, it's, it's the no brainer. And this occurs in about one third of patients. I'm gonna show you a slide later on to try to determine what are the genetic predictors of those patients? Are there any genetic mutations or other things that can help us to predict who these responders are gonna be? And we haven't completely solved that, but we have some clues. The second group are these people that we call the stable plateau where their PSA level was previously rising very, very steeply. They are placed on the bad therapy and even though their PSA doesn't drop, it levels off and it creates this plateau. And sometimes this plateau can last for months or even years. And if you were a patient whose PSA was going up very sharply and you can make it plateau, and by the way, your quality of life improves during that time as well, that's a win-win. Even though you're not getting that you know, response, so to speak, the, the plateau, as long as the quality of life improves during that period of time, is also beneficial. This happens in about one third of patients. And then in about one third of patients, the treatment does not work at all. Um, and it may even accelerate the disease. Um, and uh, that's depicted here in these orange lines. So when I discuss this with my patients, I basically tell them, there's a two out of three chance that you're gonna have some benefit. A benefit being defined as either a stabilization of your disease or a remission of your disease. So if you add the remission category plus the stable disease category, you get to about two thirds, 67%. And that leaves again, the one third of patients who unfortunately will have no benefit whatsoever or in whom you may actually make the disease worse. Now here is a, a caveat from my own clinic. This is a real patient, you know, this has been de-identified of course. And here I want to caution everyone about the possibility of what we call a bone scan flare. And all of you might've heard about bone scan flare in the context of other treatments. That can also in some patients cause a bone scan flare. What does that mean? It means that in the short term, the bone scan could look worse before it begins to look better. So this is an actual patient. This is his real bone scan at time zero when he enrolled in one of our bad studies. His PSA was 124, it was rising. And you can see after three months, all of these spots on the bone scan look darker and there's even some new ones that weren't there before. However, his PSA has now dropped down to 14. So when a patient sees this type of scan or when a physician sees this type of scan, especially if it's an oncologist who's not comfortable with or is not used to the bat, you know, he, he might abandon the treatment here, which is obviously the wrong thing to do. And the, the hint, you know, in this case was the fact that this PSA dropped. And then by six months and 12 months, 
those bone lesions are actually beginning to disappear and the PSA is continuing to decline. The challenge is at three months here, this bone scan could look this way if the patient was progressing as well. So it's very hard to distinguish unless you have a lot of clinical experience, the true progressors from the bone flares. And you know, in this case, we were better, we were aided by the PSA, which was the hint. But sometimes, you know, the PSA doesn't go down initially, as I mentioned before, it might go up. And so if you had a patient whose PSA, you know, went up and he had a scan like this, you know, there would be a huge dilemma in, in, in my mind and in the patient's mind. You know, am I benefiting from this or not? And so that can sometimes be very, very tricky to resolve. And that's where the, um, the very open conversation with the patient is, is really the key because you might have to look the patient in the eye and say, I, as the expert, really don't know whether you're responding or not. Are you willing to stick with it? In other words, are you willing to continue to take the risk? Or do you feel that you know, you've had enough and, and you wanna abandon this and try something else? And one of the things that helps when making that decision is the symptoms of the patient. If the patient is having an increase in his bone pain, probably it's, it's not an, a good idea to continue. But on the other hand, the bone scan looks like this and, and the pain is, is not worse. Or if the pain has gotten better, that can often help us to determine whether to proceed, even though the scan looks ugly, rather than to uh, abandon it. Um, I, I have some other slides about the, the transformer study, which was a randomized study where we compared that against enzalutamide. Uh, I, I could go through those, or I could stop there and take questions. What, what do people prefer? I would, I'd like to see it. Um, I don't know if you have it for Zytiga as well, um, but um, yeah, I, I'd like to see this. Okay, I, I'll just go relatively quickly. We're, we're only 20 minutes in. So one of the things that the FDA kept asking us is to do a randomized trial because they said, okay, these single arm studies are good and they look promising, but how do you know that you're doing something that's better than the existing agents that are out there? And so what we decided to do, uh, which was to do a randomized study in patients that had previously received standard ADT as well as abiraterone. So these were all patients that also received abiraterone. And then we randomized about 200 patients, 195, to receiving enzalutamide or bipolar androgen therapy. And when we designed this study, we were so ambitious and we were so um, pumped that th this was going to be better than enzalutamide. So we said, we're going to go for the home run. We're going to design a trial that looks for superiority against enzalutamide. And at the time, we, we honestly believed that we would achieve that. And ultimately, what happened was that we did not show superiority. So the blue curve here shows enzalutamide, or maybe it looks green to you. And the, uh, the red curve is the bat. This is the progression-free survival. How long does it take until the cancer gets worse? And then this is the overall survival, also not showing uh, a statistical difference. So when we presented this to the FDA, they said, you know, this is not enough for us to approve BAT as an FDA-approved medication for prostate cancer because even though you showed equivalence to enzalutamide, you did not show superiority. Uh, our you know, pushback was, isn't, shouldn't equivalence be good enough because the quality of life in these patients is way better than the quality of life of enzalutamide. And they said, thanks, but no thanks because you designed this as a superiority study and you did not show superiority. So if we had to go back, we would have designed this as an equivalent study, but of course, hindsight is twenty twenty. One of the things that was the most striking about this study was that we, are, we were eventually resensitizing patients in the future to other um, hormone therapies. So what this shows here is that in the clinical trial itself, um, the chance of responding to BAT was 28% if you use the 50% decline as your metric. 
versus 25% with enzalutamide. So numerically, greater chance of having a, a PSA response with BAT versus enzalutamide, although it's not, it's not breathtaking. Um, but the, the, the breathtaking part, um, and, and I'll, I'll skip these slides for a second. The, the breathtaking part was this. In patients who got BAT and then down the line in the future, got subsequently treated with enzalutamide, the response to enzalutamide was 78%. Whereas if they got enzalutamide without ever having previously received the BAT as shown on the previous slide, the response was about 25%. So what, what, what this suggests, and I, I think that Russ has a question, what this suggests is that by give, giving BAT prior to enzalutamide, you're tripling the chance of enzalutamide working down the line. Yeah, is that being followed up with the step up trial? And yeah. are you then, uh, okay, great. And are you uh, looking at the sequential to, to prove best efficacy and get it uh, ingrained in SOC? Are you looking at the sequential opportunities instead of just uh, one or the other? We, we are, and, and I, I have a slide about that okay. at, at the end. But yes, the, this, this was the, the data okay. that motivated us to design the step up study, which I'll show at the end. Um, the, the quality of life piece is important. So what, what these six graphs here show are different ways of measuring the patient's quality of life. The red ones are the patients receiving BAT and the blue ones are the patients uh, receiving the, um, the uh, enzalutamide. And th this is the total quality of life score, which was better. But if you look at the individual components, the one on the top middle is the physical functioning. So the physical functioning of patients receiving BAT was better than azalutamide. The one on the top right is the energy and fatigue scale. And this was better with the BAT. The one on the bottom left is emotional well-being. The one in the bottom middle is sexual desire. And the one on the bottom right is orgasmic function. So basically um, across the board, whether we looked at overall quality of life, whether we honed in on energy, whether we honed in on sexual desire, whether we honed in on orgasms, in each of these six uh, categories, the, the bath therapy you know, outperformed enzalutamide. And, and in the case of sexual and orgasmic function, I think outperformed it you know, by a long shot. So these patients, not only are they having cancer control, which is of course the goal, but more importantly, they're doing that while at the same time having um, in, improvements in their quality of life. I want to talk about um, a little bit of a, a technical slide here. One of the things that we noticed was um, early on was that patients that had cancers that had either homologous recombination or repair mutations like BRCA2, or patients that had P53 mutations, which was known for a long time to be a, a, a bad prognostic factor, those patients appeared to paradoxically have better responses to BAT. So we made this observation that, that has been replicated by others that paradoxically, again, there's a lot of paradoxes with BAT. Paradoxically, if your cancer has a BRCA2 mutation or similar mutations to that, or if it has a P53 mutation, your chance of responding to BAT, it's not 100%, but it's, it's probably markedly increased. And our colleagues at other institutions, for example, in this study, they showed the same thing. So if you look at the waterfall plot on the left, it shows a 52% chance of responding to BAT if you have a homologous recombination mutation like BRCA2, versus if you don't, the chance of responding is only 18%. Again, not a perfect biomarker, but it enriches for responses. And then the other thing that was paradoxical was there are these genes that are called tumor suppressors, and the tumor suppressor genes are P53, P10, and RB1. And the worst of the worst cancers, uh, unfortunately, are the ones that have mutations in two or more of these three genes. So in other words, P53 plus P10 mutation or P53 plus RB1 mutation. And what we showed with BAT is that these patients that have the double tumor suppressor losses, which are the, the worst of the worst, so to speak, were also the ones that had the, the best response to BAT. So a lot of the... The, the, the genetic markers that often predict inferior prognosis by the same token it, it, uh, predict 
superior response to bat, which again is a paradox, but it offers hope to patients that have these genetic sequencing studies and their doctor tells them, oh no, you have a P53 mutation. So that would seem like it might possibly uh, lead into a FDA approval also, if you can show vast superiority among a subgroup of men versus uh, existing therapies, wouldn't that be a possible end? It would be. And uh, of course, that study would have to have a control arm too. So you would have to have a yeah. P53 mutation, and then you have to compare against either chemotherapy or lutetium or something else that would be acceptable to patients. Is that being planned right now? Is that being planned, a thought of doing that sometimes? It's, it's not being planned at the moment. Um, you know, it's what we're trying to do is do we're you, trying to use the data from the transformer study to see whether that hypothesis you know, is that, correct. That's a, Sorry, Russ, you cut out again. I'm sure there will probably be a lot of questions on this, but I'm going to go ahead and uh, fill some um, dead air while Russ uh, rejoins us. Are there other markers such as AR copy number gain? Um, have you looked at RNA seq um, expressions that help to identify patients that respond better than others or even proteomics? Because some of the patients here actually have the full gamut of DNA, RNA, and um, uh, 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 proteomic analyses? Yes, um, th that's a good question. Let me, let me stop sharing for a moment so I can see people better. Um, so yes, and, and that gets a bit complicated, which is why I, I, I chose not to show it. Um, the, the higher the addiction to energy receptor, the greater the chance of this cancer responding. There is one exception, and the exception is patients with predominant ARV7 are not responding. So, so, so what you need, the, the, the perfect storm would be a very high AR, either amplified AR, mutated AR, but, but not ARV7 splice variant. And that can be you know, analyzed in two different ways, as you pointed out, Brian. One is it can be analyzed just by doing a DNA-based next generation sequencing to look for AR mutation or amplification. But the second, which is actually much more elegant, but not widely available to many men, maybe outside of this call, is RNA-based you know, transcriptome analysis, which there are signatures of antigen receptor response. You know, there are 20 gene signatures and 30 gene and 50 gene, depending on how complex you want to get. The, the proteomic stuff, I have to say, is uncharted territory. You know, proteomics is, is such a novel field. And um, I have not seen any publications yet, including from our group, linking any proteomic marker uh, with response to BAT. But um, my prediction would be that if you had a proteomic marker of androgen receptor activity, or um, if you had a proteomic marker of, uh, of perhaps um, BRCA2 or other homologous recombination deficiency, um, then you would, theory is you would be able to predict response. We have published our um, RNA predictive signature um, in the Journal of Clinical Investigation. The first author was Dr. Laura Sena, S-E-N-A, and the signature is in that paper. And the data from that paper is actually has been deposited and is publicly available. Um, so perhaps after this call, I can send it to Brad and then he can share it with you because somebody on the chat asked about the signature. Um, Rick, Rick asked about cipionate versus propionate. The vast, vast majority of our studies have been with testosterone cipionate. Um, there is no reason to think that propionate would not work. Um, the dose might be slightly different, um, but what we have used is testosterone cipionate, 400 milligram intramuscular injection once every four weeks. Other people are using that once every six weeks. The, the time interval is probably not that critical, but it probably shouldn't be more often than once every four weeks. 
the dose will be different. Uh, you're 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 getting you're getting quite a bit more peak there with uh, or, or T max and C max with or uh, T max with um, uh, propionate. Uh, along those lines, do you think that a castrate level of going down to about 150 nanograms is optimal, or do you think that we should possibly go lower to like 20 nanograms per deciliter or shoot for lower? Uh, what would your theoretical thoughts be? This hasn't been trialed, of course. Yeah. So Russ brings up a, a point that, that every reviewer mentions when we submit our papers or our grants, and, and that is you know, you picked four weeks in your first study and then you stuck with four weeks. And th they're absolutely right. You know, the four week time point was kind of empirically chosen and it may not be the optimal, you know, biological time point. And one reason that it may not be the optimal biological time point is that very few men drop down to testosterone less than 50 or even less than 100 after four weeks. But many men, you know, do drop down to less than 100 at least after six weeks. So we have been rethinking the, um, the interval, the optimal interval, and it's possible that the optimal interval, Russ, may in fact be six weeks. The challenge with doing a study with six weeks is when you have a track record of 10 prior studies with every four weeks, and the ethics committee looks at that, they say, okay, why are you switching now to six weeks all of a sudden? You've been doing four weeks for your last 400 yep. patients. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. It makes the data really messy then and hard to. But my belief is that six weeks might actually be more ideal than, than four weeks. It also makes the, the visits less frequent to the doctor. Uh, I think. This is Mike Yancey. I've got a couple of questions if I could. I know so your first slide uh, with the love studies you mentioned. I noticed that it showed bat plus a topicide, and I just wondered if there was any commentary on that. And then my second question is, I'm, I'm the type of person whose cancer puts out very little PSA, so I just wonder if any experience with low PSA out, outputters. Yeah, two questions there. The, the first was about the topicide. When we designed our first study, our, our best hypothesis at the time is how this worked was we thought that it caused double-strand DNA breaks in the cancer cell. And etoposide is a drug that prevents the repair of those DNA breaks through an enzyme called topoisomerase 2. And so it, it seemed like the perfect rationale. What, what we found out actually was etoposide has quite a few side effects that patients didn't like. And uh, unfortunately, in that first study of 16 patients, we had one patient who died of a neutropenic infection that we thought was caused by the etoposide. So after that happened, we got very, very scared and worried about etoposide. And even in the 15 patients you know, who didn't die, they did not like the way they felt. You know, that there was hair loss with etoposide, the there was nausea. So we, we pretty quickly abandoned that. Now, you know, your second question was about the low PSA producers. And probably this may not be you know, the first choice of therapy for a low PSA producing castration resistant prostate cancer. And the reason for that is, goes back to something we talked about before, which is that we think that high energy receptor level is probably necessary for this to work, or at least high energy receptor level increases the odds of this being successful. And, you know, PSA is a, a, a an output of AR activity. So, if your PSA is low, what it probably means is that your prostate cancer is not as energy receptor addicted or dependent as many others. So it may not be the ideal scenario for a PSA low patient. Have we ever done it in a PSA low patient? Yes. Have I ever seen a very striking or long-term response with a PSA You know, when it's less than five, let's say to begin with? Probably not. Um, along those lines of comment, um, my PSA, I, it goes up as far as 1.49, uh, that drops down to one on one day cast rate that use, I'm using propionate drops down on one day to cast rate to drop down to 0 0.015 in one day. So, and I asked, I talked to my MO, I mean, obviously that's not cancer, cancer regression and massive growth. It went up from 0 0.02 to 
uh, really high, then really low very quickly in one day. Um, it seems, I, I think it's androgen, not only androgen receptor dependent, but androgen dependent too. So is it overexpressed by testosterone and DHT in your opinion? Um, that possibility? It's actually, well, I mean, we, we've, we've seen the opposite because what we've seen is because you're giving ex exogenous testosterone, mm -hmm. the, the, the body thinks that the testosterone level is very, very high. So it decreases the, the endogenous production, at least that's what we believe. Um, the endogenous production in testosterone, but what about PSA though? Would PSA possibly uh, be increased, overexpressed? Um, you know, in, in, our, in our study that I mentioned with the RNA signature, you know, one of the transcripts that we measured was PSA, uh, which is the KLK3 transcript. And um, we, we saw that in the patients who had a clinical response, the KLK3 transcript over the course of 12 weeks in tumor biopsies went down, not up. Uh, okay, over time though, but um, if you look, if you did you look at it uh, during the highs and the lows, or you look at continuously, or did you look? My, mine has dropped over time. Mine has dropped from 0 0.17 when it went in about almost two years ago to about 0 0.02 today. Um, so it's dropped over time, but it has these massive peaks and then quick reductions. Yeah. You know, th that is, I think, a very important lesson that, that should be, you know, publicized and published for us. Because for the moment, you know, one of the things that we're typically doing is we are generally discouraging patients that have high Gleason scores and low PSAs from doing bath. And if your experience could be published, you know, together with your oncologist, or, you know, I, I think um, that, that might dispel the myth that even I myself might be propagating, which is that the low PSA producers maybe shouldn't be getting bad and you are the clear exception to that. I'd be more than happy to converse with you. And my MO was actually uh, talked about a, a month ago. She asked me, uh, she talked about being a clinical study, a case study, a case study, because this is, I'm a, a poster boy, if you will, for HSBC bat. Okay. There's a few other hands up, Amit and uh, Brian. So two questions I have. One, you talked about BRCA. Um, will that also be effective? Uh, you know, as far as responding well, if it's in somatic versus germline? Yes, that, that's what we have found. But by the way, if you had a BRCA mutation and it's somatic, the first thing I would do is probably not that. I would probably do the PARP inhibitor first. But, but um, you know, putting that aside, yes, we have seen, we, we have not seen better responses in the germline BRCA versus the somatic BRCA. We've seen about 60% to 70% responses in both types. Okay. Would you potentially yeah. do both looking at the, comp I'm sorry, uh, would you potentially do both along your, along your question? Would you potentially do BAT and combine with Lafarib? I think it's, it's a combat CRPC that did that? No, it was a, a study by Michael Schweitzer at University of Washington, Seattle. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. he's, pub he's published that, you know, he didn't show synergy when doing that. And it was, it was very surprising. Um, so I, I'm not quite sure um, why there wasn't synergy. One explanation is that it's possible that when you have a BRCA mutation, Olaparib by itself works well enough and that adding the bat in that context doesn't further improve the response. Oh, okay. Okay. So, so that might cover my second question. And that is, have you seen any or done any body with MMR mutations on bat? We have, and it has not worked. Okay. Um, we've treated about less than five patients, I think four. Uh, as you know, the mismatch repair patients are three to 4% of the total. Right, I know. Yeah. I'm one of those three or 4%, so. Okay. That was my question. We, we have not, we have not, of course, we, we have seen responses with pembrolizumab, as you're aware. Um, mm -hmm. We have not seen any, um, anecdotes of responses with mismatch repair. Okay, thank you. Um, um, did you have a question? Go next. Yeah. 
Uh, so you showed a very good graph of kind of on the front end, where's the ideal time for BAT to be inserted in the kind of the treatment roadmap. Uh, many of us are kind of fairly advanced and gone through a lot more treatments. Uh, are there are there on the um, uh, other extreme, have, are there any fence posts that you have determined where BAT is not a good idea, like, you know, other things that, People should be aware that okay, this is if you have gone through this, 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 uh, you know, this is not kind of the the right territory for that. Right, and and that's that's a challenge because a lot of the patients that you know think about that are the ones that have received five, six, seven, eight prior systemic therapies. So it, you know, it's it's all good to say you should do it early, but the truth is, in many patients, uh, you know, they've already had all these treatments. So some of the warning signs, you know, th there's there's no absolute warning sign as long as you have an informed conversation with your physician and you don't go into it with your, you know, with your eyes closed. If you go into it with your eyes open, you know, oncology is always about discussion between risks and benefits. And sometimes the risks might be very, very high, but sometimes the risks of untreated cancer, if you have no options, are even higher. So so some of the, the general recommendations against that are, you know, if you have symptomatic bone pain already, we generally don't recommend it because the bone pain could become worse. If you have a bone metastasis in an area that is threatening a fracture, for example, a fracture of the femur, you know, or a fracture of the spine, we also don't recommend it in those patients because if we get it wrong and we accelerate the cancer, we can cause a spinal cord compression or a femur fracture. And then the third one is if you have a very bulky prostate gland or pelvic lymph node that is threatening to obstruct your urinary tract or your kidneys, uh, we don't recommend it because you could you know, develop renal obstruction or, or kidney failure even. So th those are sort of the three greatest um, contraindications, although none of them are absolute contraindications. No, that's that's very helpful. Just one quick follow-up. Uh, some of us have a CDK12 mutation. I am I'm, have a pretty high uh, CDK12 mutation. Any data on that with BAT? You know, CDK12 mutations, um, are tricky. A few years ago, we were all enthused that they might perhaps respond to PD-1 inhibitors. There were some anecdotes and there was a high profile publication that, that suggested that. Um, we have not really seen such dramatic responses, at least in, not in my hands, with, with PD-1 inhibitors with the CDK12 mutations. I have seen favorable responses with BAT with CDK12 mutations. It's not as dramatic as with the BRCA2 mutations. So as you may know, CDK12 is, is thought to perhaps be one of the homologous recombination genes. There's some controversy about that. Um, so the, the long story short is we have seen responses with CDK12. It's probably less than the BRCA2 patients and the P53 patients. Um, but unfortunately, as many of you on this call know, uh, CDK12 is a risk factor for poor prognosis overall. So those patients typically develop castration resistance faster. They also can have chemo resistance faster. Uh, Brian or Ahmed, are you done? I'm done. Uh, Brian, do you have some questions? Yeah. So, um, kind of uh, along the lines of what uh, uh, Amit was talking about, um, just screening for heterogeneity, right? So, um, you know, we, we may have some cancer that uh, expresses a lot of AR, for example, but then we may have others that could be hormone sensitive and could take off. Um, I think some of us know a patient where that happened. How do you, is there any way to screen for that right now to look for the risk of heterogeneity where we could kill some, but, uh, but really fuel the file for fuel the fire for others? You know, there isn't at the moment. There's no good clinical way to do that. 
you know, there's a lot of emphasis about heterogeneity because we, we've known it for a long time. We've known that different patients are heterogeneous from each other. We've also known that a single patient, his tumor can be heterogeneous depending on, you know, which, um, which met metastatic site you biopsy, for example. And of course, if you do a liquid biopsy, a circulating tumor DNA biopsy, you'll get to see all the heterogeneity, even though you may not know exactly where it's coming from. One of the, you know, the, the best ways currently, which is still not a perfect way, of knowing what to target first is to look at the so-called mutant allele fraction, also called variant allele fraction, VAF or MAF. And that'll tell you the percentage of the cancer cells that have a particular mutation. Not all of the commercial um, NGS platforms report the VAF or the MAF. Um, but if, if you have, let's say, eight different mutations from a biopsy, and one of them is at you know 45% mutation allele frequency, and one is at 2%, you should target the one that's at 45% first. It makes sense, right? Because that's the one that's most abundant. And then you know you go down the list. So th th that's kind of the way that I do it. It's not perfect. And it only gives you a snapshot at one particular moment in time. And that may change because there might be one particular therapy that wipes out a particular clone with a P53 mutation, let's say, but leaves the BRCA2 clone behind or the opposite. Great. And then related to that, what, uh, what type of diagnostics would you recommend and what's the frequency? So I'm assuming like a liquid biopsy uh, while you're getting that, is that standard practice for you? Um, does it provide any insight that helps determine direction? You know, it's not necessarily standard practice for me. I, I like to get a liquid biopsy, you know, before we start. Um, do I check it every three months or every six months? Probably not. Do I check it every one month? No. You know, th there are problems with getting that reimbursed. A lot of insurance companies, unfortunately, will not uh, allow you to get monthly and pay for it, or even every three months. Um, I, I think it would be reasonable um, to check a liquid biopsy um, you know, before you start the bat, and then at, at the point that you decide to stop it, um, and it you know, in other words, to help you decide the next therapy. But as a, as a measure of response to bat, I think you have other clues which are probably easier to interpret and more established and cheaper. So of course, you know, PSA is one, you know, clinical symptoms is one, and the, the scans are the other. So I, I, I embrace liquid biopsy, but I, you know, th there's another person who's gonna be giving a talk to you guys in a few months, Oliver Sartor. If you asked Oliver, you know, he gets liquid biopsies on his patients, I think monthly. I don't know how he was paying for that done in too late. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether he's going to keep doing that now that he's at the Mayo Clinic, but um, mm. I, I don't use it as much as he does. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Robert, do you have some questions? Robert, do you have a question? Uh, you're still muted. Thanks, Russ. Um, I just got the results of my Tempest XF Plus yesterday. And there are some markers here that I don't know the significance of. Other people may have them. So I just wonder if you could comment. Uh, I do have the BRCA2 mutation at 50.3% variant allele fraction. I have CHEC2 at 0.3%. I have AR uh, P.T878A at 1.6% and APC at 1%. Median variant allele fraction at 1.3%. Is any of that significant or predictive of how I might respond? I'm scheduled to start that next next week. Well, um, you know, the, the disclaimer is that I'm not providing direct medical advice to any one given patient, but I'm just going to make sure. some broad comments. Okay. If one's variant allele frequency in bracket two is 52%, that means that it's a germline variant. Okay. So that, that individual should have a germline test to confirm that. Okay. 
And, um, and the, the reason that you know that is because if you have a germline mutation um, and the, the, pivot, the BRCA2 gene obviously has two copies, you get one copy from each parent. Mm. The mutation is only gonna be in one of the two copies. So if you have the mutation in every single cell in your body and you inherited it from one parent, the VAF is gonna be between you know 48% and 52%. So mm. th that type of patient should immediately undergo a germline test and then that's got implications for his offspring, of course, male and female offspring. Um, so that's, that's number one. And then number two is that in that particular patient, obviously we're not talking about you, sure. um, AR of 1.6%, you know, becomes much, much, much less relevant because that mutation has a tiny hmm. fraction of all the cells that have it. Tiny, 1.6% is absolutely tiny. And the check two is 0.3%, if I remember correctly from what you said, that's even smaller. So hmm. at the moment, you know, a patient like that, we're not talking about you, yeah. should ignore everything else and put all the rags in the bracket two basket for the moment. Mm -hmm. and that patient should also get germline genetic testing right away. Okay. And, and um, yes, the, the bat would have a high chance of working. Okay, great. Um, I'm curious too, so it lists some variants of unknown significance. Uh, there's one KMT2C at 47.5%. Is any of that significant or... I'm just noticing there's a couple here that are above 40%. And I think you said something earlier yeah, about the, the, the most likely explanation for that is again, germline inherited variants that you were born with that, that don't mean anything. Okay. So, right. but, but, but yes, whenever you see VAFs, you know, above the 45% level, mm -hmm. you should be thinking that these are inherited. And in, in the case of those particular genes, there are no genetic syndromes that, that are caused by a germline KMT2C mutations, for example. So the mm -hmm. assumption is that those are just benign variants. Okay. And two quick questions. One is, um, is there any uh, preference in terms of ADT? Like I'm on Orgovix now. I used to be on Lupron. Does it matter what ADT I'm on during BAT? Is one preferable to another? No, no preference. Okay. And then how about shutting down uh, T, you know, more completely when I'm cycling at, at a low testosterone phase? You yeah, said my T could be at 100 or something. Is there yeah, any with, anything I sh could do to shut it down more? I mean, you could add abiraterone, but I'm not, I don't typically recommend that. I mean, Orgovix is, is going to be as good as any of the LHRH agonists. You know, it's okay. actually going to be a little bit better because it's an antagonist. So okay. I would not do anything further. Great. Thank you. Very quickly, could he, could he possibly add darolutamide with as a very short half-life? Could he possibly do that for like a week or something? I know it has not been trialed. It's in trials right now, though, I think interleave, but is that a possibility? You know, I, I wouldn't do that. We know that darolutamide is effective. It prolongs survival when it's given as a monotherapy. Why combine something, you know, at this time when you can save it for later? Um, you know, I, I don't typically do that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Let me interrupt you. Um, or if you're done, uh, I think Ken has some questions. You know, I'm going to turn it off because we're we're kind of running towards the end, and I have, I mean, I don't want to make it personal. <laughs> um, I have been through. Um, the four cycles, four months. I mean, I had a number of adverse events, you know, mostly related to muscular, you know, lower body muscular pain. Um, could you touch on what someone might anticipate when starting bipolar energy therapy as far as the adverse events? Yeah. So um, one of the things that happens when you give bipolar androgen therapy, and it was one of the reasons that we decided to combine it with nivolumab in another study called COMBAT that I've been talking about, is that we, we do think it increases the uh, anti-tumor immune response, but it also increases inflammation. And a lot of patients uh, who, who take BAT, you know, about 15%, I would say, of, of all of them, have a very significant muscular and joint inflammatory response, which manifests as muscle pains or joint pains. 
and it's interesting because it's not it's not bone pain per se. It's not it's not the it's not pain in the in the bone metastasis, but it's pains in the muscles and the joints, and that can be um, treated relatively effectively, you know, not perfect, but relatively effectively with anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen or Motrin, Aleve, if you don't have a contraindication to those drugs, but you have to use relatively high doses. So for example, if you're using ibuprofen, you have to use 600 to 800 milligrams. And, and that's what we've often recommended to people that get the muscle pains or the, or the joint pains. The, the other thing that can happen is you can get fluid retention, especially in the feet and ankles. Uh, the high dose testosterone makes the blood vessels in the feet and legs more leaky so that fluid can leak into the, the tissues and cause edema. Um, and, and that is something that is difficult to reverse if it occurs, but we, we all usually warn people about as well. Yeah, well, I can honestly say I do take a high dose ibuprofen and it does work. You know, it's, it, it's something you have to do repetitively throughout the day, but it does work. Um, the next question was, okay, I finished the four cycles. I'm on darolutamide. You know, if darolutamide doesn't, in fact, my PSA has continuously gone up, though. It hasn't gone down. And I'm making it personal, unfortunately. <laughs> um, and right now, my PSA is like 3,000. My ALKFOS, though, is like 58. So... I'm like, okay, I've had a scan at the three month mark and I showed a little more upclick from like the November mark, but with low ALKFOS and a super high. So what's the overexpression element with PSA? I know PSA is a terrible marker in general for prostate cancer, but it's the one we all use. Yeah. Um, well, I, I have to go because I have another meeting, but I'll just answer that quickly. Um, your cancer might have a combination of high AR, but also maybe some AR splice variants in there. So AR splicing variants like ARV7 is also going to cause high PSA expression and may not respond to BAP, whereas you know amplified AR, you know might respond. So you might have a speaking of the heterogeneity, a bit of both. And the, the short answer is, you know, with without a clear worsening of the scans, um, you know you you may want to stick with it. You know, in consultation with the BAP that is in consultation with your oncologist. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing that with Paul at MD Anderson. So okay. I think I'm good. I just was more interested in adverse events. I really appreciate